Hello, and welcome to Naloxone Education and Distribution, healthcare providers on the front line in preventing opioid overdose. My name is Sarah Melton. I am Professor of Pharmacy Practice at the East Tennessee State University Gatton College of Pharmacy. I do not have any financial or other relationships to disclose regarding this presentation. And this presentation will not include discussion of off-label, experimental, or investigational use of drugs or devices. At the end of this learning session, you should be able to describe validated tools and practice-based methods to assess the risks for opioid-induced respiratory depression, identify models for overdose education and naloxone distribution that are applicable to various practice settings, discuss Good Samaritan protection provisions for healthcare providers, first responders, and the layperson, describe the pharmacology of naloxone, demonstrate appropriate administration of intranasal and intramuscular naloxone products, explain the steps in addressing an opioid overdose emergency, discuss the costs and appropriate storage of naloxone products, and provide appropriate education to at-risk patients and laypersons regarding naloxone rescue. Overdose is very common among persons who use illicit opioids such as heroin and fentanyl, and also among those who misuse medications prescribed for pain, such as oxycodone, hydrocodone, methadone, buprenorphine, and morphine. As you know, the incidence of opioid overdose is rising across the United States. To address this problem, emergency medical personnel, healthcare professionals, people who use drugs, and other community members who may witness and respond to an overdose are being trained in the use of the opioid antagonist medication naloxone, which can reverse the potentially fatal respiratory depression caused by an opioid overdose. Note that naloxone has no effect on non-opioid overdoses, such as those involving methamphetamine, cocaine, benzodiazepines, or alcohol. Let's first look at commonly misused opioids. On the left, you will see the generic name of opioids that are commonly misused on the street. And on the right, you will see street names. For example, hydrocodone is often caused by those who misuse substances, hydros, norcos, bikes, or watsons, mainly watsons because of the brand name that is desirable with the highest street value on, uh, for you know, purchase or use on the street. Oxycodone, you've often heard called oxys or ox or oxycotton or hillbilly heroin because of its origination um, with the misuse and development of opioid use disorder predominantly in the Appalachian region. If you look at other um, opioids, synthetic opioids such as carfentanil, which is the um, opioid that is used by veterinarians as an anesthetic, it is called on the street drop dead and serial killer. So that's pretty significant. Wanted to also point out um, methadone, the street name for that can also be called meth. Um, and it's important that you know that because some patients may actually be describing methamphetamine, which of course is a stimulant, not an opioid. So you wanna make sure you clarify with your patient which meth they're talking about. And then uh, heroin, commonly called dope, smack, the big H uh, in our region. Buprenorphine, which is typically uh, prescribed uh, through wavered prescribers for the treatment of opioid use disorder under the brand names of Subutex or Suboxone, are often called on the street Sobos, Bupes, Stops, Stop Signs, or Oranges because of their uh, orange color. So let's look who is at risk for an opioid overdose. When you have a patient in front of you, it's important that you be aware of these risk factors so that you can evaluate uh, them and determine if they do have a need for co-prescribing of naloxone. Common risk factors include abstinence. So those that have been released from incarceration, 
those have, that have relapsed when they were in recovery to use, and those have just recently completed detoxification. Of course, the reason behind this is because they have lost their tolerance, may go back to use the same dose of opioid that they used before, and easily overdose through respiratory depression. Someone that has had an overdose previously is, is extremely high risk of having another overdose, so they should be prescribed naloxone. Anyone with a history of a substance use disorder, any time where an opioid dose is changed or changes in purity that occur, so that would be, uh, for example, fentanyl or heroin that's purchased on the street, we're never assured of what the purity is um, or what the drug is being cut with, so that's a high risk factor. Mixing substances or polypharmacy, so combining opioids with alcohol, benzodiazepines, or any other medications that could cause respiratory depression are very important risk factors. Any patient with a chronic medical illness, such as with the lung, so COPD, asthma, and sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, put the patient at high risk, and anyone with hepatic or renal compromise, because that's how the opioids are eliminated from our body, and with any compromise they may accumulate. And then using alone or being socially isolated uh, is a very high risk factor because there's no one there to call for help. Other risk factors include changing from immediate release to a long-acting opioid, so going from something like Percocet that has oxycodone in it with Tylenol to something like Oxycontin. Those that are prescribed more than 50 morphine milligram equivalents a day Someone with comorbid mental illness is also at risk, specifically depression. Those that are receiving prescriptions from multiple pharmacies, prescribers, um, and those that are receiving a methadone prescription. And that's because of its unusual kinetics, long half-life, and risk for accumulation and subsequent respiratory depression. So now we're going to look at some validated tools and practice-based methods to assess the risk for opioid-induced respiratory depression. When you're working with the patient um, in your practice and you want to assess risk, it's very important to obtain a history of the patient's past use of drugs, whether it be illicit or prescribed medications that have misused potential. So here's a question that you could ask. In the past six months, have you taken any medications to help you calm down, keep from getting nervous or upset, to raise your spirits, to make you feel better and the like? Or have you been taking any medications to help you sleep? Have you been using alcohol for this purpose? Have you ever taken a medication to help you with a drug or alcohol problem? Have you ever taken a medication for a nervous stomach? Have you ever taken a medication to give you more energy or to cut down your appetite? When you're getting the patient history, you should also ask questions about the use of any type of alcohol and over-the-counter preparations. And positive or affirmative answers to any of these questions warrants further investigation. To continue with assessing for overdose risk when getting your patient history, always review all medications and take a substance use history starting from the drug of initiation which often occurs in adolescence. Always check the prescription monitoring program or the controlled substance database as it's called in Tennessee and you always want to take an overdose history. So ask your patient whether they have overdosed or had a bad reaction to taking opioid medications, see if they've ever witnessed an overdose, or if they've received training to prevent, recognize, or respond to an overdose or medication-related oversedation. Now we're going to talk about the RIA-SORD, or the Risk Index for Overdose or Serious Opioid-Induced Respiratory Depression. This rating tool estimates the likelihood of life-threatening respiratory depression or overdose among medical users of prescription opioids. This was first validated in the United States among the veteran population and then validated in the general population. The assessment in the general population was a case control analysis in a cohort of 18 million patients using prescription claims data. The authors of the study, 
Zedler and colleagues in 2015 in pain medicine, identified 7,234 cases of overdose or serious opioid-induced respiratory depression, which we're gonna abbreviate OSORD, and compared them with 28,932 controls. Common risk factors associated with the opioid-induced respiratory depression were assigned a score for each risk factor using multivariable logistic regression modeling. This newer rise toward tool for the general population is now a 16 question survey and has a total maximum score of 146 points. So let's look at a case study and we'll calculate the rise sort score. We have a 45 year old patient who presents to the pharmacy with a prescription for oxycodone extended release 80 milligrams every 12 hours with 10 milligrams of immediate release oxycodone every six hours for breakthrough pain for a chronic hip disorder. That's approximately 200 morphine milligram equivalents per day. And this patient has been on this dose for the past eight months. The patient has a 40 pack year history of smoking. Medications include paroxetine 10 milligrams at bedtime, Alprazolam, one milligram twice daily as needed for anxiety, and Teotropium, 18 micrograms handy haler used once daily. Past medical history is significant for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, depression, and anxiety. The patient has had three emergency department visits in the past year for hip pain, kidney stones, and pneumonia. So let's go ahead and look at these risk factors and see which ones are present in our patient. First of all, does the patient have opioid dependence? Yes, they've been on high dose opioids for a long time, so they've obviously developed dependence. They also have chronic pulmonary disease with COPD, so they would be assigned five points for that. They also, um, when we look at does the patient consume any of the following medications that are listed, the answer is yes, because they are on a long acting formulation of oxycodone. And when we look at specific medication, oxycodone is assigned three additional points. They are also prescribed a prescription antidepressant and a prescription benzodiazepine, which is the alprazolam. And when we look at the current maximum prescribed opioid dose in morphine milligram equivalents per day, the patient scores 16 points for this because they're on over 100 morphine milligram equivalents a day. And then finally, looking in the past six months, has the patient had one or more emergency department visits or been hospitalized for one or more days? So yes, the patient has had multiple emergency department visits so that would be a score of 11. So if we look at the evaluation of the score, here you have a chart that has the risk index score on the left, which scores from zero to above 67, and the risk of opioid-induced respiratory depression on the right, which goes from 3% to 86%. So for our patient, they score greater than 67 points, which means they have a very high risk, 86% um, probability of experience opening uh, opioid-induced respiratory depression. So this is a quick and easy way that you can um, assess for the risk for respiratory depression and make your decision about co-prescribing of naloxone. So what do we do? What are uh, interventions we can uh, perform in case of we have a patient with elevated risk? The first thing we want to do is really educate the patient and their caregivers. They need to understand uh, about naloxone, and the risk of what we call respiratory depression, but usually we call it a breathing emergency for the layperson or patient so that they can understand what that means. We also wanna use increased caution in our opioid selection and when we escalate the dose. 
Always want to consult with pain management specialists in case someone has a very high risk of overdose. And certainly close monitoring for the emergence uh, of any respiratory depression or known risk factors for it. And then probably most important, we want to make sure we do have that prescription of naloxone that is given for administration by family members or caregivers as a rescue medication in the event of suspected opioid uh, overdose emergency. Next, let's move on to some models for overdose education and naloxone distribution that are applicable to various practice settings. So if you look at this chart that was published um, by Tracy Green and colleagues in the Journal of Harm Reduction in 2015, they look at different models that are available across the United States. And we have uh, two different pathways we can go. So we can have a pharmacist that is trained in overdose prevention that is able to provide naloxone directly to a patient without a prescription that would be needed from a prescriber, which of course would be uh, a, a medical doctor, a doctor of osteopathy, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant. So when, it, when a person presents to either place, the first thing we're gonna do is screen for risk factors, which we've already talked about. And the pharmacist that can then provide naloxone via collaborative practice agreement with a prescriber. And as you know here, there are different states that are listed for this model. So Rhode Island is well known for this collaborative practice agreement where a pharmacist specifically works with a prescriber that comes up with a protocol of how they are able to give the naloxone directly to a patient or someone that has a family member that is at risk. They're also providing direct naloxone to the patient or caregiver by a standing order issued by a prescriber. So the nearest example of that is really um, in Virginia and Tennessee, both have standing orders where they are able to, um, the pharmacist use a standing order that goes across the state through the Tennessee Department of Health or the Virginia Department of Health. Some states have a protocol order, such as in California and Nevada. Um, you can actually bring a prescription to the pharmacy, just like you would um, any other prescription. It can be sent electronically, so that's what we're most used to um, traditionally. And uh, so that can be done in all states where any prescriber can just prescribe naloxone and the patient goes to the pharmacy to pick it, pick it up and then the prescription would fill, be filled by the pharmacist. Um, if you look over to the left here, um, the patient would be um, or the caregiver would consent to that uh, collaborative practice agreement so they understand they're not going through a prescriber, that that is through a practice agreement or a standing order. The pharmacist then would um, select the product and dispense it regardless of whether it's coming from a prescriber or through the collaborative practice agreement or standing order. Most of the uh, product that is dispensed is the intranasal product, the four milligrams that I'm going to show you shortly. And then the process would be a pharmacist would bill to insurance, provide overdose education to the patient, as well as education about the medication. And that would be either to the patient or to the person that has come in and asked for it because they have a concern about a loved one or a friend. And then there's documentation of receipt of that medication per whatever the state protocol states um, through an agreement or through law legislation. With regard to being in health systems, um, you're going to have clinical pharmacists usually working um, there that will recommend appropriate use of opioids at the inpatient setting and at discharge. They can assess and help monitor the patient. They can help look up the uh, prescription drug monitoring program results using the controlled substance database, help with diversion and uh, help with making sure medications are getting to where they need to and not being diverted by family members or by healthcare professionals there in the hospital. Certainly, uh, other members of the team can provide education of staff and the patients about non-opioid treatments for pain. 
And when opioids are prescribed, encourage co-prescribing of naloxone and perform bedside education with patients and family members. So that's a really important role of your clinical pharmacist that would be on your team. So let's now look at Good Samaritan protection provisions for healthcare providers and our first responders and the layperson. So Good Samaritan protection um, and other regulations that have been put forth across the United States are really important because they help remove the barriers to naloxone access and allows wider distribution of naloxone. Some examples of these state laws include increased layperson access to naloxone. So that is just anyone can go to any pharmacy in Virginia and Tennessee and ask for the naloxone and uh, be able to get it without having to go through an appointment at their primary care provider's office. Um, third party prescription of naloxone. So this is an unusual situation that happens with naloxone where when a medication is dispensed, it's not going to be used on the person it's dispensed dispensed in their name, they may be using it on someone else. So that's a third party prescription. And then we've already talked about the standing order uh, or a collaborative practice agreement that allows um, naloxone to be purchased without a prescription per se from a prescriber. Now, Good Samaritan protection is very important because this pr uh, provides immunity from civil or criminal liability for those that do prescribe naloxone, those that dispense it, so pharmacists, and those who administer it, so a lay person or first responder, the person that's first to someone who is overdosed. Uh, legal protection for those who report opioid overdose for the purpose of getting medical assistance. For example, if someone is in uh, a situation where illegal activity is going on, perhaps par paraphernalia is present or drug use uh, with illicit substances is going on. There uh, are state protections for those that are willing to report that overdose appropriately, stay with the person who's overdosed, get them help. Um, so they will not be uh, criminally charged in some states and Tennessee has that provision. So let's look a little bit about opioid overdose laws uh, and their associated with use and mortality. So there was a national study that looked at the impact of naloxone access and Good Samaritan laws on uh, opioid overdose deaths in 2018. And that was by McClellan and colleagues published in Addictive Behaviors in 2018. What they found is that naloxone access and Good Samaritan laws are associated with 14 and 15% reduction in opioid overdose deaths. Among African-American patients, naloxone and Good Samaritan laws reduced opioid overdose death by even a greater amount, 23 and 26% respectively. And neither harm reduction measures increase non-medical opioid use. So giving naloxone and having it available did not make people use more opioids. Naloxone access and Good Samaritan laws should be considered very important strategies to address opioid overdose. When we look at state laws regarding naloxone distribution, there is a very helpful resource that you can access online, and that's the Prescription Drug Abuse Policy System. So PDAPS, very easy to access and a lot of helpful information there. For example, here we have uh, naloxone overdose prevention laws. You can ask questions, does the jur jurisdiction have a naloxone access law? or do prescribers have immunity from criminal prosecution? So you can click on those questions and then the states will light up. So you're easily able to see if your state um, has those specific uh, laws, regulations that you're looking for. So let's go ahead and jump in and look at a little bit more of the specifics about naloxone, including the pharmacology. So naloxone belongs to the class of an opioid antagonist. So it is a blocker. Its mechanism of action is that it reversibly binds to mu receptors, and it has a greater affinity for mu receptors than all opioids do. 
So if we look at our uh, diagram here, this purple receptor is an opioid receptor. And here on the green would be an opioid molecule such as heroin, fentanyl, or oxycodone. And typically when that's taken, it would fit in this receptor perfectly and cause an opioid related effect. However, when we have too much of the opioid present and someone has overdosed and has respiratory depressant and we administer naloxone either intramuscularly or intranasally, because naloxone has such a stronger affinity to that opioid receptor, these little naloxone molecules are going to kick off all the opioid molecules for a short period of time and that's going to let the person breathe again. The onset of naloxone is about 30 to 45 seconds, and it lasts about 30 to 45 minutes. Now the half-life is about an hour. It does undergo glucuronidation in the liver, and then it's excreted in the urine. But the key point here is just that naloxone has that very strong affinity to kick off the opioid receptor, kick the opioid off the mu receptor, and that it will start working quickly within 30 to 45 seconds and will last about 30 to 45 minutes. There's often concerns about naloxone, some myths that are published in the media. It's important to realize that naloxone has no misuse potential. You could spray the naloxone spray in your nose all day long and have zero effect unless you were already on, had an opioid on board. And some people think it allows people to misuse or take more opioid without fear. We know that that's not accurate. Anyone who's worked with someone with the disease of addiction know that they avoid um, a precipitated or any kind of withdrawal at any cost. So administering naloxone to someone is going to put them into a very significant withdrawal very quickly. Also remember that naloxone has no effect if accidentally administered or self-administered to someone who's not taking opioids, for example, a small child. So let's go ahead and look at appropriate administration of intranasal and intramuscular um, naloxone products. So here we have the Narcan nasal spray, which is what we are most commonly distributing now. Um, the naloxone here um, really has fallen out of favor because of the atomizer that had to be recalled and it takes time to put the entire system together. But we're going to go ahead and look at how to give the nasal spray naloxone just in case you ever come across it. So the first step is you're going to take your syringe and take off those yellow caps. Take your naloxone vial and pull off that red cap. You're going to take your atomizer and grip it with the plastic wings and go ahead and gently screw um, the, um, the naloxone uh, capsule here into the barrel of your syringe. And you should gently turn it until it catches. The way that this naloxone is administered is you just will insert the white cone of the atomizer into a nostril and give a short vigorous push on the end of the capsule to spray naloxone into the nose. Now one half of your um, naloxone will be administered into one side of the nose, so one nostril, and then into the other. So this is two milliliters, so approximately one ml in each nostril. And if there's no reaction within about two minutes, you're going to want to give your second dose. So let's go ahead and watch the demonstration of this. So this is the nasal spray. There are three parts the atomizer, the plastic tube, and the naloxone. First, you're going to take the yellow parts off the top and the bottom of the plastic tube. You're going to remove the purple cap on the naloxone. You're going to take the atomizer and hold it by its plastic wings, and you're going to twist that into the plastic tube. What if you held it by the white bit? It's better to hold it by the plastic wings so it doesn't break. You're then going to take the medication and twist that into the end of the plastic tube. You don't want to twist too tight, but just enough until you get resistance. This is glass, so you want to be careful that it doesn't break and twist too hard. You're going to then spray the naloxone half of the tube into one nostril and the other half into the other nostril until the naloxone is completely administered.
For our FDA approved intranasal naloxone, it comes as typically four milligrams of naloxone in 0.1 ml. So it's very concentrated naloxone compared with the other version that we just looked at. It's important to know you're going to administer this in just one side of the nose, so one nostril, and that would be um, for any adult or pediatric patients, all the same dose. Important that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the steps that you always get emergency medical care after using this on an overdose victim. And any additional doses should be administered using a new nasal spray with each dose. And again, if they don't respond within two minutes, we're gonna give that second dose. And we're gonna talk about rescue breathing measures in just a minute. With our intramuscular naloxone, it comes as a branded product that is an auto injector that actually talks through the patient and works, um, they, tells them exactly how to administer it, which you'll see in a second. You can also um, get naloxone in the 0.4 milligram per cc little vials, uh, and that has to be administered with two syringes. So let's go ahead and look at these products. For the auto injector, it comes with two of the active products. So you can see those are purple and yellow. And it comes with a trainer. This is the back and the front so that um, the person can practice with this as many times as they would like. So with the auto injector, it has visual and voice instructions that help guide the user through the injection process. It's important to remember that each auto injection contains only one dose of medicine, so you're going to discard it after use. First step is to pull the auto injector from the outer case. Don't remove your red safety guard until you're ready to use the auto injector. Second step is to pull off the red safety guard. And to reduce the chance of an accidental injection, do not touch the black base of the auto injector, which is where the needle comes out. If an accidental injection happens, you're advised to get medical help right away. Note the red safety guard is made to fit snugly. You have to pull firmly to get it to come out and be removed. And you do not want to replace the red safety guard after it's been removed. When you're ready to use it, you're going to place the black end against the middle of the outer thigh through clothing. So that means it can go through pants, jeans, etc if needed, and then you're going to press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Important to remember, if you're going to give the auto injection uh, injector to a infant less than a year old, you want to pinch the middle of the outer thigh before you give the naloxone and continue to pinch while you administer the naloxone by auto injector. So let's go ahead and watch the demonstration of the auto injector. Let's demonstrate the auto injector. Okay. So your prescription would come with two of these devices as well as a trainer that looks like this. There are written instructions as well as audio. You can pull the top off. This trainer contains no needle or drug. If you are ready to use, pull off red safety guard. To inject, place black end against outer thigh, then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Injection complete. And that's how it works. Thank you so much for taking the time to demonstrate it for me. Absolutely. In my experience, is patients really like the auto injector because in the stress and um, excitement of an overdose, having something that's gonna walk you through it step by step seems to be very um, reassuring to them. So let's look at the intramuscular naloxone if you were to prescribe the little vials and the syringes. Step one would be to remove the cap from the naloxone vial. Step two, insert your needle through the rubber stopper with the vial upside down. Then you're gonna pull back the plunger and withdraw the one milliliter. Step three, you're gonna inject one milliliter of naloxone into the upper arm or thigh muscle. Again, you can go through clothing with this. And step four, if no response in two to three minutes, we wanna give that second dose following the same steps. 
So let's watch the demonstration of this product. Let me demonstrate the muscular injection for you. Okay. So there are two parts for this one, the naloxone and the intramuscular syringe. You're going to remove the cap from the naloxone, take the cap off the needle. Ooh, that's a big needle. It's actually the same one that we use for giving vaccinations, even here at the pharmacy. You're going to place the needle into the medication, draw up one cc into the syringe here, and you're going to place this needle into a large muscle, the arm, the leg, and push the medication into the victim. Sound okay? Yeah, I think I could do that. Great. If you notice in Virginia and Tennessee, you've probably seen uh, the naloxone rescue kits that are available. So in Virginia, we have the Revive um, kit, and this is what the Tennessee one looks like. Uh, Virginia's is through the Department of Behavioral Health, and Tennessee's is through the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. So each kit that is put together should have a minimum of two doses of naloxone and two delivery devices. And some locations that have high illicit fentanyl prevalence have increased the number of doses to three because you may have to give um, multiple doses of naloxone. And then the kit components can be placed in a pharmacy bag or they could be packaged in a special naloxone rescue kit bag like we have in our state. Um, and collaboration with a local organization that's engaged in overdose prevention initiative may provide special bags or containers to promote a uniform message to the community. And that's really what Tennessee and Virginia both have done. So let's look at the steps in addressing an opioid overdose emergency since you now know the naloxone products. When you look at an opioid overdose, the causes of this include a reduced sensitivity to changes in oxygen and carbon di dioxide outside of our normal ranges. We then see decreased tidal volume and respiratory frequency. Respiratory failure and death um, eventually ensue because of this hypoventilation. The overdose develops over minutes to hours, and what we see are decreased respiratory rate, drop in blood pressure, drop in heart rate, and our body temperature. Eventually, the person becomes completely unresponsive. If you look at their pupils, they're going to have meiosis and that they will be very small pinpoint pupils. And you may notice a blue and gray color around the lips and nails because of lack of oxygen uh, to the extremities and the face. It's important to recognize an opioid overdose and distinguish it between someone who is high versus a true overdose. Someone that is high on opioids will have very relaxed muscles. They will have impaired speech, so it'll be slow or slurred. They will look drowsy and lethargic, so lethargic, and they will look like they're nodding off with heavy eyelids. But they will be responsive to verbal or painful stimuli. They'll have a normal heart rate and normal skin tone. And you compare that with an overdose victim that will be very pale and clammy, when you look at their respiratory rate, the breathing is going to be infrequent or absent. You may even hear snoring or a gurgling like a death rattle that can precede um, death. And they're going to be unresponsive to any stimuli. So that's the key distinguishing characteristic between someone who's high in an overdose is that unresponsiveness. They'll have slow or no heart rate and cyanosis again present at the lips or fingertips. There's several myths out there on reversing an opioid overdose that you need to be aware of. It's very important to educate your patients or the lay person not to put the person in a bath. They could drown, they're unconscious. Do not induce vomiting or give the person something to drink. They're going to choke and possibly aspirate. Do not put the person in an ice bath or put ice in any orifice. We know that cooling the body temperature down is going to further depress heart rate and really accelerate uh, death. Do not stimulate the person in any way that can cause harm. 
And by that, I mean slapping them repeatedly, kicking or punching them to assess for responsiveness. We know aggressive actions have resulted in long-term physical damage to overdose with victims who have been stimulated in that way. Instead, we just want to put our hands on either side of their shoulder and gently uh, shake them and, and call their name and ask if they're okay. Um, do not inject them with any foreign substances like salt water or milk. It does seem to be prevalent in northeastern Tennessee and southwest Virginia uh, among some people that have heard that you should inject milk intravenously to re reverse an opioid overdose. We've heard many tell us that. So it's very important to educate that you do not want to do that because that would lead to severe infections of the skin, the heart, endocarditis, for example transmission of the virus abscesses. So let's look at the steps of how to respond in an overdose situation. The first thing you want to do when you're teaching patients, family, friends, or caregivers is to recognize that overdose. And we already talked about how you're able to distinguish that with the lack of um, response. They're gonna be completely unresponsive. You wanna call 911 as quickly as you can, and that might mean that you need to get someone who's there with you to call 911 while you start administering the Loxone as soon as it is available. You know the different products that are um, available. And if the person does not respond quickly to the Naloxone, you're going to want to start rescue breathing or chest compressions per that rescuer's level of training and how they feel comfortable. They may um, be receiving instructions from 911 operator on how to do either the rescue breathing, but more commonly it'll be the chest compressions. And it's very important to emphasize that the lay rescuer needs to stay until help arrives. Uh, and uh, if they do start breathing, it's important that they be put in the recovery position which we'll talk about. So step one, check for responsiveness. Again, put your hand on either side on their shoulders and gently shake them and call their name. We used to recommend doing the sternal rub. Um, don't really recommend that anymore because of damage that and, and uh, injury that was being caused by that. You may also pinch an earlobe to check for responsiveness. Uh, we want to initiate rescue breathing if the person is not breathing, and that would be one breath that's given every five seconds for 15 seconds. We want to call 911 as quickly as we can. If we have to leave the person, we always want to put them in the recovery position. And the way that you put a person in this position is you're going to tilt their head back and lift their chin to open the airway. Turn the person to one side, placing the hand against the chin, which you can see here in this diagram. Bend the knee against the floor. Tilt the head back and check their breathing. Call 911 and wait till it arrives. Of course, the reasoning for this recovery position is if they were to start vomiting, we do not want them to aspirate it um, if that would happen if they were lying on their back. Step three is to continue that rescue breathing and administer naloxone, and that can be given intranasally or intramuscularly. And it's important to understand that typically within the first minute, remember naloxone works within 30 to 45 seconds, regardless of the method of administration, that this person will be put into precipitated withdrawal. So that's usually characterized by quick onset of diaphoresis, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, significant pain. Withdrawal is very painful, painful down to the bones. People will describe it as miserable. And people, um, it's extremely rare that you would die from an opioid withdrawal unless you had many, many extenuating circumstances, but the patient is going to be very miserable. And what typically happens is they're going to wake up very confused. They're not gonna remember, um, you know, or recognize what's going on. And with that confusion, they may become agitated. It's rare that someone was going to come up swinging. Um, however, it is recommended that um, if they are super agitated, you wanna step away and protect yourself. Step five would be to resume rescue breathing if needed. And step six is to conduct a follow-up 
and to administer that second dose if the person is still unresponsive after about two to three minutes. When we look at the question of giving compressions and not oxone rescue, the American Heart Association guidelines that were put out in 2015 actually integrated naloxone administration with chest compressions. It's still controversial, but appears rescue breathing alone results in worse outcomes compared to when compressions only are given with naloxone administration. So typically you're going to have the 911 operator giving instructions of how to do chest compressions if the lay rescuer has not been trained in CPR. And you want to instruct the layperson trained in CPR to use these guidelines. Here's just uh, the actual algorithm so that you can see where CPR is started and then um, uh, naloxone is recommended there. So let's look at the cost and appropriate storage of naloxone products. Uh, the intranasal naloxone, um, the one that comes in the pre-filled syringes with the atomizer is approximately $80. The FDA approved naloxone nasal spray is around $140. And uh, both of those are fully covered by most insurance now. The least expensive for cash-based price would be the 0.4 milligram per cc vials, which are available at $35. And then our naloxone um, auto injector cost is very expensive at typically more than $3,000 cash price. However, you can refer the patient to the manufacturer's website for discount information. This is actually dispensed by specialty pharmacy and sent through the mail uh, for no copay to the patient. And if a patient uh, does not have insurance and makes less than $100,000 a year, they would be eligible for the patient assistance program and be able to receive that product at no charge. With regard to storage of naloxone, we want to store naloxone in the original package at room temperature. We want to avoid light exposure, so don't keep it in a window. And typically the shelf life of naloxone is about 12 to 18 months. We don't want to insert the naloxone in that pre-filled syringe until ready to use. Again, we don't typically see that used any longer except in the hospital, and usually that's for um, IV or IM use because if you do that, it expires within two weeks. And you always wanna monitor the expiration date of your naloxone and replace it before it expires. And note, when there are no other alternatives, you should certainly use expired naloxone because uh, any naloxone is better than no naloxone. So let's look at appropriate education that we should provide to at-risk patients and lay persons regarding naloxone rescuer. One of the things that we want to typically do is use some motivational interviewing for opioid use disorder. So building rapport with that patient is very important. People have to believe that you've heard their concerns or their side of the story and that you valid, have validated them. Patients need to feel that they're being respected and cared for as an individual person with unique circumstances, beliefs, values, and needs. The patients need to believe that you're willing to work with them to solve the problem and that they're in charge. So our key points here are that our patients and caregivers need to trust you, both your compassion and your skills as a healthcare professional. The next is looking at importance. People need to make sense of what is happening with their condition or their risk or why they need to make the change we are recommending. So if the information you provide does not make sense to the patient or caregiver in a way that they can connect to and believe, they're gonna reject that information and not implement the recommendation. So the key point here is that all human beings are sense makers and we need to address how they make sense of health and wellness. The next thing we wanna make sure that we are um, doing is developing confidence. So people need to believe that they can make the change or implement the plan and be successful. So patient and caregivers need to know exactly what to do if they have an adverse reaction with a medication. And substance use disorders are frequently associated with relapse, which can erode both the confidence of patients themselves and their family and loved ones. Patients and caregivers need to make informed decisions about their health and wellness. So the key point here is we need to give patients real, actionable, and accurate information to be successful. 
There are common mistakes that are often made. These include discrediting inaccurate information or myths that a person believes without first validating that you heard the information and assuring the patient that it's not wrong or crazy or stupid. So an example is someone who says that they believe that naloxone is only for people who overdose on heroin. And certainly that is a statement that shows a lot of stigma. Um, but you're gonna encounter patients who have heard that and they don't understand why they would need naloxone. Another mistake is not explaining in enough detail for people to really understand their condition or risk. An example is, I take my medications as prescribed, so why would I be at risk for an overdose? And another mistake is sugarcoating things or not stating the potential risk of overdose and other risks. For example, you wouldn't want to say, well, it's just a little risky to combine benzodiazepines and opioids when we know it is extremely risky. There's some key skills of motivational interviewing you want to remember when working with this patient population. And first is we want to discover and validate the concerns or beliefs to avoid loss of face and to listen and to avoid arguing with that patient or caregiver. So things that you can say include, hmm, I hear that from a lot of people, or that's a common concern that people have about whatever you're talking about. Or it sounds like you've done a lot of research on naloxone. It seems like you're concerned about, and then you talk about whatever the concern is, or it sounds like you had a bad experience, and then address that with the patient. And you always wanna ask permission before you hand or give them information. So an example would be, would it be okay if I gave you some information today about breathing emergencies with opioids or would it be okay if I talk to you about your prescription for naloxone? It's important to refer to overdose as a breathing emergency when someone is resistant to the messages of their personal risk of overdose. Give the person accurate, specific, personalized information that makes sense to them to allow them to make informed consent. For example, saying your blank, whether it be a medication they use, alcohol, conditions, or other factors, significantly increase your risk of a breathing emergency. And you wanna use analogies that are visceral and understandable. For example, talking about naloxone as a fire extinguisher. It doesn't cause you to start a fire, but it's there if a fire starts accidentally. You want to ask the patient and caregiver to help come up with solutions. Example, it sounds like you aren't ready to seek a formal treatment and recovery program right now, and that's okay. Which of the things we talked about would you feel comfortable doing to decrease your risk of a fatal breathing emergency? And you can also get a conditional commitment. It sounds like we could find a formulation of naloxone that can be given as a nasal spray, and it's covered by your insurance, and you'd be willing to have it in home just in case. So can we go ahead and get that ready for you? We want to acknowledge the patient that, that the patient is truly the one in the driver's seat. We want to empower them to make and change, monitor symptoms and make decisions. Here's an example. We hope that by taking your medications as prescribed and avoiding alcohol, you won't experience a breathing emergency but having naloxone available can save your life just in case. And we want to give a menu of options if at all possible and include effects on others where relevant. We wanna include risk of breathing emergency to others visiting in the home. For example, children or teens that may be in the house or just coming to visit other kids. Always best to ask if someone is act if someone is not responsive. You don't want to just quote, let them sleep it off. So always important to take action if they're unresponsive. And then summarize and plan your next steps with the patient is very important. So let's look at an example of some patient dialogue. BH is a 68 year old patient who's being discharged home from an outpatient procedure with a prescription for oxycodone and acetaminophen five slash 325 milligrams every six hours is needed and they're given 30 tablets. 
He takes oxycodone extended release, 20 milligrams twice daily for chronic back pain following a motor vehicle accident with multiple fractures. And clonazepam, one milligram twice daily for generalized anxiety disorder. Other chronic medications include two medications for high blood pressure and three different inhalers for COPD. The pharmacist may say, I noticed on your prescription records that you're taking a long acting pain medication, Oxycontin, and a medication for anxiety, Clonopin, plus three inhalers for a respiratory condition called COPD. Is that correct? The patient would respond, yeah, I've been taking all those for years with no problems. Why are you asking? Pharmacists might say, Unfortunately, those medications in combination significantly increase your risk of having a breathing emergency, especially your history of COPD. We recommend that you have a medication to reverse a breathing emergency called naloxone in your home in case this happens to you. Patient responds, I know about naloxone. That's for drug abusers who overdose on heroin. Are you accusing me of abusing my meds? I only take them as prescribed by my doctor and I have never had a problem with them. Pharmacist responds, you're right, we do use naloxone to help people who have overdosed on heroin. However, naloxone is also helpful for people who have a breathing emergency from prescribed medications as well. It's great that you only take your medications as prescribed by your doctor and I'm glad to hear you've not had any problems with them. Would it be okay if I gave you some information about naloxone and why I think it might be important for you to consider having it at home? Patient responds, I guess so. Pharmacist says, having naloxone in your home is like having a fire extinguisher to put out a fire. You still follow all the recommended safety procedures to prevent a fire, but you have the fire extinguisher available in case a fire starts accidentally. Having the fire extinguisher does not make it safe for children to play with matches, as an example. It just allows you to put a fire out if it happens, despite all of your fire safety efforts. Patient responds, hmm, that makes sense, but I don't see why I'd have a breathing em emergency since I have been taking these medications as my doctor prescribed. He would know if they weren't safe for me, right? Pharmacist responds, I get that same question from a lot of my patients. Even when taken at prescribed doses, pain medicines can sometimes accidentally result in a breathing emergency. The reason that you're at risk is the combination of oxycodone and clonazepam with your history of COPD can cause your breathing to slow too much and you may become unconscious. If that hasn't happened to you yet, I really hope it never will, but still the risk is there. I also find people feel safer having naloxone in their home in case they ever forget that they took their medication and they take a second dose by accident. Or if children visiting the home ever get into the medication and have a breathing emergency. So hopefully that discussion sample is helpful for you to plan how you're going to talk um, with your patients and use motivational interviewing. I want to conclude with some helpful resources. The College of Psychiatric and Neurologic Pharmacists have the Naloxone Access Practical Guide for Pharmacists, but really this is for any healthcare professional. This is an easily download downloadable PDF that you can print off or just keep on your computer. I highly recommend the prescribe to preventorg website. The videos that you saw in this presentation came from there and there's a lot of helpful educational materials at that website. Thank you for joining this program, Naloxone Education and Distribution, Pharmacists and Healthcare Providers on the Frontline in Preventing Opioid Overdose. If you have any questions following this program, please don't hesitate to email me at Melton, M-E-L-T-O-N, S T at etsu.edu. Thank you very much.